Good afternoon, and welcome to The Narrow Path. I need to tell my producer I'm getting an echo in my headset that doesn't belong there. I'm getting to hear myself twice. There we go. That's much better. All right. Now you're listening to The Narrow Path, and I'm listening to me only once, not twice. It's hard enough listening to me once, as I'm sure all of you can attest, but I was listening to me twice. That's been remedied. We are broadcasting today on Wednesday, November 23rd, 2005. The program is live from 2 to 3 in the afternoon, Pacific Standard Time. And if you'd like to be on the program today, you do so simply by calling a number that will put you through to me on the air. And you can either, if you have a question about the Bible or Christianity you want to ask, or if you have a point of disagreement you'd like to bring up, feel free to do that. The number to call is one 800 438 Nine zero. Let's talk to uh, James, who's calling from Santa Cruz, California first. James, welcome to the program. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, I have a question, and I'll, I'll take it off the air because I have to do some work. I'll listen on the radio. But um, I've been reading this book about uh, dispensationalism, and uh, it's explaining dispensationalism and defending it, and uh, it makes a claim about the church, or that is uh, the body of Christ, the believers, that it... Um, that it was never prophesied about or uh, mentioned in the uh, either in the Old Testament or in the Gospels, and that it was only revealed uh, to Paul. And I was just wondering uh, what you thought about that particular uh, statement. Okay, can I ask who wrote the book? I I don't have it in front of me, but I know okay. it's, it's a dispensational dispensationalist uh, author. And yeah. It's not- Charles Baker, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'll be glad to talk about that. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate your call. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's one of the distinctives of the dispensational system of theology. They believe that there's uh, succinct, uh, or su- distinct, I should say, uh, categories uh, for the church and for Israel, and that they don't overlap that uh, in the Old Testament, God was dealing with Israel and didn't let anyone know that there was going to be such a thing as a church, which they often refer to as a Gentile church. And so they see a difference between the Jewish state or the Jewish nation and the Jewish race on the one hand and the, and the Christian church on the other. And they say that the church was not actually even mentioned in the Old Testament. It was revealed, as James mentioned, to uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, in you know, and he became the first church apostle. They suggest, in some cases, if they're especially if they're Bollingerite dispensationalists, they suggest that even uh, Peter and James and John didn't preach the same gospel Paul did, because they were stuck into the uh, the, the Jewish ideas, and uh, and Paul was the one who knew about the church. This is quite a mistake uh, on their part, I'm afraid. The church is, of course, mentioned frequently in the Old Testament. There are many references to the Gentiles coming together with the Jews to worship Yahweh, and that's what's happening in the church. Uh, Gentiles have joined with the Jews who believe in, jo- in Christ, the Messiah of Israel, and are, are, you know, together with them, part of the church. That's what the church is. Uh, the Apostle Paul and Peter and, uh, you know, virtually all the writers of the New Testament were capable of quoting from the Old Testament to prove their points. And Paul quoted quite a few Old Testament verses about the church and about Gentiles coming in, as they are now doing and have been doing for the past 2,000 years. That is the church. But Peter Peter did that, too, right on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit fell and the people were speaking in tongues and the curiosity of the crowds caused them to gather to see what was going on. And Peter said, well, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, the Lord said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Well, that's, that was the birth of the church. And Peter said that was prophesied in the book of Joel. That's in the Old Testament. So obviously the Old Testament did predict the church. And, uh, and uh, you know, the dispensations are very, I think, just very mistaken about that. Uh, the Apostle Paul would be an example of one who could quote quite a few Old Testament verses about the church. Uh, it says in Romans chapter 15, Verse 8 and following. Now I say that Jesus Christ has become the servant to the circumcision, I mean the Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. Well, of course, that's happening now, as Gentiles and Jews together glorify God for his mercy in Christ. Paul says, as it is written. And now he quotes 
four uh, different Old Testament passages to prove that that was predicted in the Old Testament that the Gentiles would worship God along with the Jews, which is, of course, in the church, exactly what's happening. He says, for this reason, uh, he, he, he says, as is written, for this reason I will confess you among the Gentiles, I will sing to your name. That's a quote from Psalm 22. And he says, and again he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, laud him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles. Uh, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now, Paul, of course, understands that to be Christ. Therefore, that the Gentiles have come to hope in Christ was predicted in uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and in the Psalms that Paul quotes from. Now, that's the Old Testament. So, obviously, the church is in the Old Testament. Now, more than that, I think the dispensationalists are mistaken in making a clear distinction between Israel and the church. Because the Bible doesn't. Uh, in the Old Testament, the Israelites who came out of Egypt were referred to as the church. Long before the New Testament was written, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. About 285 years before Christ, a group of scholars in Alexandria translated the Old Testament into Greek. That's called the Septuagint. And on many, many occasions, I think, I forget the exact number, but they, like, scores of times, the Septuagint referred to the congregation of Israel as the ecclesia. That's the Greek word that's translated church in the New Testament. So the Old Testament Jews are called the ecclesia many times in the Greek Old Testament. And then the New Testament was written in Greek, and, and ecclesia was used to speak of the people who followed Jesus Christ. So there's a, co a continuity. The people who are now following Jesus Christ are simply a continuation of those who are following God in the Old Testament. It's just that Jesus has come now, and he hadn't before. But uh, those who were believers and followers of God in the Old Testament, the, the ecclesia there, uh, continue to... Uh, well, I mean, those people are dead now since Jesus, they lived before him. But since he came, in the transition from the time before and after his coming, uh, there were people who were Jews who were believers in Yahweh and who became believers in Christ. That means they were part of the ecclesia of the Old Testament. And when Jesus came, <clears throat> they were part of the ecclesia of the New Testament. And they, there, there was no major transition in the sense of uh, changing loyalties. It's just a matter of them accepting their Messiah when he came. And uh, we would expect all of those who were the faithful remnants of Israel to have done that. And, and so the faithful remnants in Israel were the same people as followed Jesus in his lifetime and have followed him since, the people of Yahweh. Now, those people are Jews and Gentiles. That was true in the Old Testament as well as in the New. And so the church is not a Gentile church. It's true that those who follow Christ today are predominantly not Jewish people, but there are thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of Jewish people who do follow Jesus Christ. There may be millions, for all I know. And so they are part of the church, too, just as Paul and Peter and, and those Jewish guys were. So a Jew who believes in Christ is part of the church. A Gentile who believes in Christ is part of the church. And there's no distinction between the church in the Old Testament and in the New, except that the Messiah that the Old Testament church was looking forward to has come. And so the church today is able to look back and on and rejoice in the fact that the Messiah has come. So there's no, there's no place for making such a, a clear distinction between the church and Israel. The fact that the Gentiles would come into this church was predicted in the Old Testament, and that was observed by the apostles when they were talking about the Gentiles coming in in their own day, coming into the church, they quoted Old Testament passages to show that this was something that was predicted. So it certainly is uh, it certainly is impossible to say with credibility that the church was not known in the Old Testament. It's true that what Paul said a couple of times, uh, he actually said more than a couple of times, he said it in Romans 16, he said it uh, in Ephesians chapter 3, and in, in Colossians, I think, chapter 2, that the gospel as he preached it, included features that were not known and were not revealed to the sons of men in prior generations, but were made known to the holy apostles and prophets through the Spirit. So Paul's message had elements in it that were not made clear in the Old Testament. And Paul tells us what those elements are. In Ephesians 3, he says especially that the Jews and the Gentiles would be together in one body in Christ. 
So the concept that the church would be the body of Christ was Paul's insight. Paul got that revelation. And, uh, and as far as I know, Paul's the only writer of the scripture that uses that term, body of Christ. But uh, he's not the first person to speak of the church. The body of Christ is just one of the things that we know about the church. It is the body of Christ, and that was a mystery until it was revealed to Paul. But the church existed before that, and it existed way back in the days of Moses, according to Acts chapter 7. In Stephen's sermon, he says that Moses led the church in the wilderness, and that would be referring to Israel back then. So, church existed in the Old Testament. It wasn't born at Pentecost. There was, there was a new dimension of the church that was added to the believers at Pentecost, but there were believing people long before that. And they were the church already. Jesus spoke of the church twice in the Gospels. I, why, the, why a dispensationalist would say the church is not mentioned in the Gospels is beyond me, because there it is. I mean, in, in Matthew 16, Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church. And in Matthew 18, he said to the disciples, If somebody will not repent of their sin when they're confronted more privately, then he said, Take it before the church. So the church was certainly mentioned before Paul's conversion. Jesus himself made reference to it and used that very term. But so did the Old Testament frequently. So, James, I hope that clarifies that for you. The church certainly was not a new development with Paul. It was not a new revelation to Paul. But there were some things about the church that were revealed to Paul that had not been previously known. But that's, that's a different kind of claim. Or right, we're going to talk next to Tom, calling from Monterey, California. We have lines open for you. If you have a question from the Bible, maybe you have a difference of opinion you want to express, or you just want to dialogue about something that you're confused about or want some more thoughts about, give me a call, 1-800-438-5090. 1-800-438-5090. Tom, welcome to the program. Hey, Steve. How are you? Good to hear from you. Yeah, it's been a while, huh? I've had uh, a few things going on in my life, so I uh, haven't had a chance to call you, nor have I had a chance to send you a check, and I need to do that. I need to get off my uh, duff and get in there and send you a check, because I know you can always use it. So, hey, uh, last time that I called, we were speaking of uh, uh, the uh, why why it seems that the New Testament uh, uh, kind of uh, illuminates Peter uh, uh, so much. In, in the writings there, and I know last time that uh, we ended the call that uh, you kind of said that, uh, uh, and you, you've often said this before, I don't think you use the same words, but you uh, often use, uh, Tom, you need to uh, not look at that with your Catholic eyes and look at it with an unbiased eyes. Uh, uh, when I do, I still see Peter just, uh, it, it's just uh, overwhelming to me that Peter is uh, picked out of the crowd uh, by Jesus, uh, and even when Jesus ascends into heaven, he's even still uh, have a very prominent role, and uh, so the one thing that I wanted to get back to that we never did talk about, I know we talked about all the different things that, that Peter had uh, done, but, uh, and you just uh, mentioned it, uh, Matthew 16, where uh, Jesus uh, renames Peter. And or Simon and calls him Peter, and we know that uh, any time there's a name change, uh, especially by God, uh, it means something very important. And uh, uh, I know we have talked about that before. And I just that that uh, Matthew sixteen, eighteen there, fifteen through about eighteen, uh, just is is. Uh, full of all kinds of good things for Catholics. <laughs> and I just wanted to see, I know we've talked about that before, but it's been a quite a long time ago. And I wanted to see what you had to say about that. Uh, it, it sure seems to me that, that Jesus is saying that, uh, uh, Peter, you're the rock, and on this rock I'm building my church. Okay, just one one uh, technical point doesn't make much difference in what you're saying, but uh, the occasion that Jesus actually changed Simon's name to Peter was at their first meeting. In John chapter 1, in right. verse 42, um, and it was, uh, you know, Caesarea Philippi, which you're talking about now, is obviously somewhat later, but, right. um, and name changes I sp are important, I don't uh, deny that. I I've never had a problem acknowledging that Peter is, uh, was especially prominent. Mm -hmm. That's, that's now, a fact. How about, how about him being called the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church? 
Do you? Uh, uh, got no problem with that either. Oh, but that, but that to me that doesn't speak of what it speaks of to you because you think of the church as an institution, uh, and and you think that it's uh, an institution has got to be built on the man Peter, and upon his successors that he has to have a successor leading that institution in every generation. Uh, I, I don't see any th- reason to read that into there. I, well, I, I mean, that Jesus, that Jesus said that he built his church on, on the rock. Now, of course, you, you know that Protestants often don't think that the rock he's referring to is Peter, but I've got no problem. It doesn't matter to me if he was or not. Uh, I mean, Jesus, Peter himself indicated that Jesus is the rock. That the that the chief cornerstone and all that the church is built on. And of course, Peter said that in First Peter chapter two. But uh, in a sense, the church is built on Peter. In a sense, the church is built on all the apostles. It says in Ephesians chapter two that we are all who are part of the church are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So I mean, it would certainly not be out of line for Jesus to mention to Peter, since Peter is one of the apostles. You know, you're a rock. You're a rock. The church is going to be built on you. Uh, so are all the other apostles. We see in the in the holy city in, in Revelation 21 that there are 12 foundation stones of the, of the city, and they have the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So we're not talking about just Peter here. We're talking about the apostles. They are all stones. They are all, in Revelation 21, stones upon which the church is built. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so there, that's, a, that's a teaching of Scripture that Protestants don't have anything to be, you know, uh, intimidated by. It doesn't, it doesn't prove anything about the Catholic doctrine. Mm-hmm. It, it, what it points out is that Peter, who was definitely prominent among the apostles, was also sh- a sharer with the other apostles in the privilege of being uh, part of the foundation of the church. And the church was built upon him uh, and on the others as well. Mm-hmm. But, but, they, but they all said that Jesus was the chief cornerstone and the primary stone. And the main stone that the, uh, Paul said, of course, in Ephesians or First Corinthians three, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. But see, Jesus Christ uh, is the ultimate foundation that underlies the, the twelve apostles, and they are a foundation stone upon Him. I would say, mm-hmm. since they saw themselves built upon Him. Amen. But the but but the issue here is really, Tom, that you believe that that the church is an institution that has to have institutional leadership tracing their authority back to one man in the first century, and that would be Peter, because you believe Peter had priority over all the other apostles in some authoritative sense. I don't see any reference to Peter's special authority over the other apostles in, in this or any other passage in the Bible. Now, see, that's that's where I differ with you, and that, that's one of the reasons why I brought this whole subject about Peter and why his prominence in, in the New Testament. And I see, if I, if I read this with open eyes, and, I, and, and again, I'm definitely tainted towards the Catholic Church, but if I look at it as openly as I can, I see Jesus changing his name to rock. I see that Jesus says we're going to build our church on this rock. I see Jesus giving him the keys. I see Jesus having, uh, throughout the New Testament, well, Jesus is alive. Jesus is constantly picking Peter out of the crowd and using him as the leader and saying, you know, I'm leaving. You're going to be in charge here, buddy. And actually, I don't see him doing that. See, I, I, all the way through, I just see. Uh, yeah, I again, see Peter prominent. You, you know, you, you, on previous broadcasts, you've called and you've, you've read a, a, quite a long list of scriptures where Peter was very prominent, mm-hmm. both, in, both in the gospel stories and the book of Acts. And, uh, and you thought, well, why does the Bible depict him that way if it's not what we Catholics think? And I say, well, you know, I think the Bible depicts him that way because that's the way it happened. Peter was prominent. Peter was outspoken. Peter pushed himself forward sometimes. And Christ also gave him uh, certain special privileges as well. Peter was part of the inner three, the inner circle, uh, Peter, uh, James, and John, who did things specially with Jesus who, uh, when the other apostles were not uh, invited like into uh, up, up to the Mount of Transfiguration or into the room of Jairus' the daughter when she was raised from the dead. Uh, these three men, Peter, James, and John, were taken in. But, uh, but the Roman Catholics don't make the, don't make the point about James and John for some reason. They only want Peter to be the guy. And I see Peter as, as a very outspoken, uh, early on, uh, quite a leader among the apostles. But, but I don't see him as appointed to be the leader. And, and later on, James is more a leader among them from about Acts chapter 15 on, and even Peter seems to defer to James. 
So I don't I don't think there was one apostle that Jesus appointed to be the all time leader of the bunch. And again, I think if if, if a person were to look at all of the uh, scriptures with Peter in it and read it with an open mind and look at it, Jesus is usually with all of the apostles and he picks Peter out. In, in Matthew 16, he does that in front of all the other ones and he says, hey, you're the rock, here's the keys, you got the keys to the car, now you're going to drive. Uh, well, you know, I, Jesus addressed that comment to Peter because Peter was the one that spoke up. Uh, Jesus, Jesus asked the apostles, mm-hmm. who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up uh-huh. because he was the most outspoken of the bunch. And because Peter spoke up, I don't Jesus... Think so. Because Jesus well, even says, it says so. that it's not you, it's the Holy Spirit speaking in you. Again, that's another statement that he's saying, hey, you've got something special here, buddy. No, 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 no. He, he, said, he said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven revealed it to you. <clears throat> so what he's saying is, the fact that you recognize me as the Lord and the Christ is not because of, uh, you know, personal, uh, you know, shrewdness or, or cleverness, but because God showed it to you. But he doesn't, but he's speaking to Peter for the simple reason that Peter spoke up and, and Jesus answers Peter. No, uh, we have we have no reason to believe that had Andrew or James spoken up and said the same words, that Jesus would not have repeated that to him. Possibly. Because it would, be tr- it would be true of them as well. All right, it, it, that's right, he didn't, and, and, and so the Gospels simply record what happened, uh, but we can't say that it happened because it's significant that it happened. I mean, that, that it was Philip who went and got Andrew to tell Jesus that some Greeks had come to see him in John chapter 12 doesn't, it's not, to me it's not very significant that it was Philip who went and found Andrew, uh, it, but, if, but if it was Peter who did so, you'd think that was significant. If, if it were, yes, because the... If we look at, again, Matthew 16, how much is there? It's just, he, he, Jesus is giving him these these names and these keys and building the church upon the rock. Right there, we start with that. Then we go out and we see Jesus launches a boat to talk to the crowd. Whose boat does he get into? He gets into Peter's boat. And why do they even, why do the uh, writers of the New Testament even bring that up? Because they know that, hey, there's the guy's boat. That's Peter's boat. It, it means something. Everything that's in the Bible means something. And if we read it with an open mind, we look at, we look at all the stuff. Jesus walking on the water and Peter walks out on the water. There's, there's reasons behind all of this stuff. And, and, and Peter pulling in the 180 something fish or whatever amount it is all by himself. I mean, it's just, there's a reason why they're showing Peter having this extra Okay, okay. It, there may be a reason, but I don't think it's the reason that, that the Roman Catholics are giving it. I, I don't really see a direct connection between Peter owning the boat that Jesus stood in and Peter being, you know, in the special position in the church throughout, you know, later history. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the Peter, uh, uh, you know, Jesus held the upper room meeting with the disciples in the, the house of Mark's mother. Now, that wasn't Peter's house. Why didn't he do it in Peter's house? I mean... What's it matter? It doesn't matter whose house it was. It doesn't matter what boat Jesus was standing in. Jesus is a significant person, not who held the title to the house or the boat. And, you know, you, you brought out a number of passages where Peter is singled out and figured prominently in doing something or saying something or, or something being said to him. And that's true, but you can find passages like that with the other apostles, too. It's not like he's the only one. I mean, when it came to feeding the 5,000, it says in John chapter 6, uh, in verse 5, then Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Mm-hmm. Now, now, why didn't he ask Peter? And, and then it says in verse 8, one of the, his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barlows. Well, why didn't Peter come up with the solution? Well, because he didn't. That's, I mean, there were 12 apostles and they all did some things and the Bible records some things to do. It, to say that Jesus turned to Philip and asked him where we're going to get food, and, and he didn't turn to Peter, uh, you know, maybe I should start a rival denomination, because I think Philip is the main apostle, because look how much he stands out there. And also, you know, over in, in John chapter 12, uh, it says in verse 20, now there were certain Greeks among those who came in to worship uh, at the feast, and they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and they said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Well, my goodness, why did they come to Philip? Didn't they know Peter was the guy to talk to? And then it says, then Philip came and told Andrew. 
and and they went and told Jesus. Now, why didn't Philip go talk to Peter about it? Because I mean, he's the guy who's got the in with Jesus. You see, he does. Peter didn't have an in with Jesus any more than the other apostles. He was he, he was an apostle, and the apostles all had special uh, authority and special privileges. And I don't, you know, I don't have any problem as a Protestant. I don't have any problem at all with acknowledging that Peter was very prominent, very authoritative, and so forth, like the other apostles were. And even if we can acknowledge, which, again, as a Protestant, I have no reason not to, that Peter seemed to be very much the spokesman for the group in the early chapters of Acts. He wasn't always after that, but he was at first. Um, So, okay, someone had to be. If the guy who had spoken up had been Nathaniel, uh, I wouldn't assume that Nathaniel, therefore, is the head of the church for all time. I believe Jesus is the head of the church, and the apostles are all, you know, sent by him to to represent his uh, his teaching to the world. Mm-hmm. And and Peter was one of them. Yep. And I I agree with you that that uh, Peter is not always picked out of the crowd, but he is definitely, without question, listed like <laughs> I don't know how many times more than everybody else, but it's significant enough. Enough. I think if if somebody were to go through and honestly look at it. I don't see how you can come up with that Jesus is not picking him out for a special uh, uh, mission amongst the apostles there. Uh, Well, suppose we acknowledge this. mm -hmm. Suppose we acknowledge that Jesus picked Peter out to be the spokesperson, at least in the early years, for the apostles. Uh, So, what does that have to do with us today? Well, again, that goes back to the Davidic kingdom of having uh, the uh, prime minister who Peter fulfills that obligation of the Davidic kingdom. And there, problem, we've gone over this over and over again. You and I, I know. Just, there we go. But here's, here's the, uh, let, let me even acknowledge that. I don't, but, but let me. Let, let me suggest that along with you okay. that Peter is the, is, was Christ's chosen prime minister for his, for his kingdom. Okay. Now, Jesus has gone to heaven and Peter has gone to heaven, but Jesus is still the king and Peter will still be the prime minister, I assume. No. In, a, in an earthly kingdom, which the kingdom that we are living in uh, is an earthly kingdom, uh, Jesus is always the eternal king. We always know that. Uh, Peter is the uh, prime minister. When he passes on, he passes those keys on to the next person, and it's, and it's gone Why? for 2,000 years. Why? Why would he pass them on? Because that's the way the Davidic kingdom works. Well, in the Davidic kingdom, the king was replaced, too. So when Jesus died, did did he get replaced? Well, that's an imperfect kingdom, isn't it? Well, it's an imperfect analogy is what it is. No, well, you see the, the, not at all. Like Jesus all very much through. so. Why, why then does Jesus constantly, in the beginning of Matthew, he brings up his lineage and says that he is the, the son of David? I mean, if there's a reason why he's bringing this up. And all the way through, of course. they're looking for the Messiah, the 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 new son of David who's going to free us from all of our captivity. Well, the ultimate captivity is our sins. Well, hey, Tom, we don't disagree about that. I don't think any Christians disagree about that. What, what, we're having, what I'm having trouble with mm-hmm. is understanding why it would be, in your analogy of the Davidic kingdom, where Jesus is the king, like David, right. and Peter is the prime minister, like whoever was the prime minister under David. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the king dies and goes to heaven. Mm-hmm. and the prime minister dies and goes to heaven. Mm-hmm. All right? Now you say, okay, the king doesn't have to be replaced, but the prime minister does. Well, why? They're both alive in heaven, aren't they? Why can't they continue to reign? Because I, uh, the last I saw, I haven't been able to talk to anybody who has passed on to heaven. So? Who's, who's going to run? The have you ever talked to Jesus? The physical, earthly, yes. Have you had a reply? I have not had a reply in a physical form. I've had it in, in my heart. Spoken yeah, I don't, I don't know why I would have to have a physical reply. Well, why not? Well, I, I mean, if he gave me a physical reply, I wouldn't object to it, but I don't see why it has to be that way. Why would I, why would I have to look at Jesus in person to get a reply from him if his spirit is given to me to guide me and to communicate with me? Why, why do I need to see Peter, or, or, or Peter's successor, the Pope. Okay, once again, we go back to the Davidic kingdom. Jesus is the total fulfillment of the king, right? So now, now I understand where you're going, that you're saying, okay, well, once, once the prime minister and all the ministers, all the other apostles, all defeats, 
then there's no more church on earth, that there's no more physical kingdom on earth. Earth. That's no, no, that, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. Is as soon as Christians began to die in the first century, mm-hmm. what changed was uh, until the first Christian died, the church was on earth only. When the first Christian died, then part of the church was in heaven and part was on earth. As more Christians died, then a larger portion of the church was in heaven and 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 the portion on earth. Uh, the church, ever since the first century, has been an entity that is partially in heaven and partially on earth because some of it's gone on into glory and some has not. So uh, it just so happens that we believe, and I think you do too, that uh, when Christians pass on, they don't really die. They just go, they live on in heaven. And uh, and so if, if the apostles held authority on earth, then their dying on earth doesn't change anything. They're still part of the same church, the same kingdom. Uh, it hasn't ceased to exist and they haven't exited it. They haven't left it. They're still in it. And, and we would They're just in that portion of it that's in heaven. And we would both agree with that. The, the thing that's different about this is you have a physical kingdom on earth. There is a heavenly kingdom that I believe will is there, but it will be in its total fulfillment when Jesus comes back to earth again. Uh, but right now, you even look at the, the Old Testament uh, uh, showings of the Davidic kingdom, and there is a definite succession of uh, well, of kings, of kings and officers. Right, exactly. But we know uh, that there is only one king, Jesus and, Christ. Right, and there's no need for there to be any more than twelve apostles uh, leading uh, the the kingdom. I mean, if there are more, that's fine. But they, but the point is, the same king who was reigning the kingdom two thousand years ago on earth is now doing so from heaven. And therefore, the same 12 apostles that carried authority in the church 2,000 years ago on earth are now in heaven as well. And why can't they still be doing what he's doing? Why can't they do what they did as much now as them? And, and if they, he can. If I, he I, can. Would, I would believe that they, they are in a spiritual way, but they cannot do it in a physical way here on earth. That Jesus They don't need to. They don't need to. They don't need to do it in a physical way. So, so if, if we have a, um, a moral question... Um, uh, we are to pray to Jesus, and we come up with 35,000 different church uh, answers. That's what I'm saying. Well, I don't, on moral questions, I don't think there's 35,000 different answers that Christians give. I think that on moral questions, Christians tend to be very much in agreement if they're true followers of Jesus. And there are a few uh, moral issues that are you know, uh, ambiguous, mm-hmm. and where Christians don't all agree. But I believe that even then, they need to consult God and be led by the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. Christianity Christianity isn't about uh, learning the rules and living by the rules. That's legalism. That's, that's not Christianity. Christianity is about following Jesus Christ and being led by His Spirit. And, you know, learning to be led by the Spirit is a, it's a, it's a, it's a school. It's a, it's a course. Uh, we sometimes don't get 100% on it, you know. Sometimes we miss what he's telling us to do, and, when, and then we smart for it, and then we learn to listen better next time, and so forth. I mean, God is teaching us all, but the point is, he is teaching us all. And that's why John said, you don't have any need that any man teach you, but the anointing which dwells in you teaches you of all things. So, I mean, I, yeah, I'd rather trust the Holy Spirit than some man to teach me, wouldn't you? Oh, Definitely. Well, then, that's why I don't go to the Pope for my answers. Well... Or any other man. <laughs> and that's why I say, when you look at, uh, like, Moses in the desert, uh, there were people who disagreed with him, and they didn't get very far with that. There's The, gr- the ground opened up and swallowed them, right. That's right. So, uh, uh, it's it's interesting that Jesus says... But I disagree. I, do, I disagree with the Pope, and the ground hasn't opened up and swallowed me. No, not at all. It's just, just the fact that I think Jesus has given those keys, and there's a reason for the keys. He's given the name change. Okay. For the name change. And uh, like I say, I think if anybody honestly looks at, pull up all of the, the go into a concordance and look up all of, well, of Peter, and look it all out, I don't see how anybody can not see that Jesus has picked him out, especially as a, a special role amongst the apostles. So. Okay, we'll let you have the last word. My lines are all full. Right. i got to take right. some of the calls. God bless.
Bye-bye. God bless you, Tom. Bye-bye now. All right, you're listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. And with uh, Tom's call ending, we have one line open for you at 1-800-438-5090. one 800 My name is Steve Gregg. This is a daily program. We're on from 2 to 3 in the afternoon Pacific Standard Time. Our next call comes from Slim in Salinas, California. Hey, Slim. How you doing? Call, Good to hear from you again. Quite a bit now, huh? I yeah, yesterday, I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to get... Had to get in on this uh, this one with Tom. Uh, uh, I think yeah, you agreed with him that uh, that Peter was uh, indicated by Christ several times. However, uh, 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 Jesus didn't specifically say anything about Christ, but he did specifically say that uh, when you're older, somebody else is going to lead you, and that would seem to be an awkward statement for someone that's uh, put in a leadership position to lead others. And that to be carried on. So, well, yeah. Uh, thought. Although that particular prediction Jesus made was predicting uh, Peter's death right. and his martyrdom, right. and so a man, a man could be the leader and still be martyred. But, right. uh, but yeah, I, I just don't see how the particular verses about Peter that Tom has raised, or 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 any verses in the Bible about Peter, would lead to the conclusion that Peter becomes. The, you know, the guy who has to have a successor always right. leading the church. I just doesn't, I don't see that anywhere there. Yeah, it seems it, like, yeah, there's no passage or any scriptural support for that. That's, uh, it's a Catholic passage. tradition, because yeah. He, because his name is mentioned so many times, that means that he's supposed to have a successor. And, uh, I mean, there's probably, there are probably individuals that have mentioned, uh, more times than Peter in the Bible, but they have. I think I think Paul is. I think Paul might be mentioned more than Peter, right, but right. but uh, no one says that you know he has a successor. Right. Yeah. So I just thought I'd call it share that. Uh, that uh, okay. Appreciate that, Slim. Okay. Well, you guys take care. Have thank you. Have good Thanksgiving. I mean, okay. Let's do thanks. Let's do Thanksgiving first. Okay. Yeah. All right. God bless you. Bye bye now. All right, you're listening to the Narrow Path Radio Broadcast. We're going to talk next to Vicki from Salinas, California. Also, hello, Vicki. Yes, hello. I just want to bring something to the table on the whole Council of God uh, over the issue of Peter. And I just have a couple of questions. One is, how does the scripture that um, we're not to think more highly than we ought to think of men come to the table on this issue? And also, uh, the one that talks about... Um, uh, in one of the Corinthians where it says that you, in following certain men, are you not carnal and walk as men? And I'll have to take my answer off the air because I'm on a cell, but I do okay. thank you. Okay. Those right. are very good points. Bye-bye. Thank you, Vicki. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, those are good points. Very good points. In First uh, Corinthians, the first uh, passage she mentioned is um, in First Corinthians chapter 4, I believe. And he says, basically, um, he says in verse 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos, this is Paul speaking, uh, for your sakes, that you may learn in us, or that, that is by our example, not to think beyond what is written, and that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against another. Uh, that is, he's referring to the fact that back in chapter 1, he said, uh, Now this I say, each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos. Or, I am of Cephas, which means Peter, or I am of Christ. Now, Paul says, <coughs> is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, Paul takes the case where people were saying, I am of Paul, and says, this is inappropriate because I, I didn't die for your sins. You weren't baptized in my name. But he says, in addition to those who were saying, I am of Paul, there were some saying, I am of Peter. And I'm... and, and Pe- Paul doesn't in any sense say, now listen, you guys, stop saying I'm of Paul. Stop saying I'm of Apollos. You all should be saying I'm of Peter, because that's what the true church is under. Now, he doesn't say that Peter and Apollos and Paul are all named in contrast to Christ. It is Christ who died for your sins. It's Christ in whose name you're baptized, not Paul, not Peter's, not Apollos. And it's interesting that, that uh, Paul doesn't treat Peter as having any special authority more than Paul or even Apollos. And Apollos was not an apostle. Uh, they were all preachers. He says, who are these people? They're just people that you've listened to and through whom you've been blessed. You know, Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, 
that when he first met Peter, uh, or one of the first times he met Peter, maybe the second time he met him, that um, it says that he went and he talked to Peter and James and John to kind of let them know what he was preaching and see how they felt about it. And he says, concerning that, uh, he says, yet, uh, where shall I read? Let's read verse 6 here. He says, uh, but from those who seemed to be something, he means Peter, James, and John in the context, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. He says, for those who seemed to be something added nothing to me, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcision had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcision was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. It says, when James, Peter, and John, <clears throat> who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that they had given to me, uh, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Now, what's interesting is Paul said that when Peter and James and John met with Paul, they pretty much came to an agreement that Paul had the same kind of apostolic ministry among the Gentiles that Peter had among the Jews. Now, if that's true, then it would seem that Paul, not Peter, would be the apostle that we Gentiles, who are, you know, if we don't have Jewish ethnicity in us, if we're going to pick one of the apostles to say, now this is the guy whose authority we stand under, because Paul said that even Peter agreed that Paul was the one sent to the Gentiles, and Peter was sent to the Jews. So I don't really see that Paul would have been at all at home with the Roman Catholic suggestion that Peter is somehow over the whole church. And even in speaking of, of his meeting with Peter James Brown, he says, who they were doesn't make any difference to me. God shows no personal favoritism to any man. And what he meant by that was that <clears throat> when he went to talk to these guys about his gospel, uh, he was not going to be overly impressed with their position, he just wanted them to know what he was preaching because he wanted to be forthright and, and make sure that he wasn't doing anything, uh, you know, sneaky behind their back and make sure that what he was preaching is the same thing as they were preaching and that they knew what he was preaching. But he doesn't indicate that he had some sense of accountability or being under Peter in a official sense. He specifically says who they were doesn't matter. The, you know, they're not anyone special. I mean, they were apostles, of course, but they, it, they weren't uh, any more so than Paul. So he said, I'm not coming kowtowing to these guys or deferring to these guys. I'm just letting them know what I'm preaching, because they might want to know. So I don't see Paul's writings supporting at all the idea that he saw Peter or that the church should see Peter as occupying a special role, especially that business about some are saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter. And, and Paul says, no, you, you weren't baptized in the name of Paul. And he could have, as he said, you weren't baptized in the name of Peter, because you weren't. Well, let's talk to Terry, who's calling from Albany, Oregon. Terry, welcome to the program. Uh, thank you. I heard uh, Father speak. I was visiting relatives that are Catholic, and he said that the oral tradition and the Word uh, has a lot that they should pay attention to rather than the Bible. He didn't come out and say it like that, which has uh, contradictions in it, and the contradictions popped up as the... Uh, Different manuscripts and scrolls were transcribed by uh, people with one candle in the dark in a cave. So I don't <laughs> think there's any contradictions in the Bible, and we may not understand them all right now unless we study extensively. Most of them can be figured out if you figure out who uh, the person in that particular chapter of the Bible was talking to, whether they were talking to the Jews or the Gentiles or... And so on, and I want to know what you yeah. think about that, and I'm going to hang up. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. I, I would agree. I don't think there are contradictions in the Bible. Uh, at, at least I don't believe there's any of any consequence. You know, uh, there are differences in the way stories are told, and whether these differences should be seen as contradictions or simply uh, giving different details, I guess would depend on one's predisposition. Someone who wants to find contradictions can certainly find passages that are saying different things and can say, oh, that's contradiction. But, see, a contradiction doesn't exist unless there are two statements that can't both be true. That's, that's the nature of a contradiction. When one statement is made and another statement is made and the two of them cannot both be true, then they contradict each other. If there are two statements that are simply different in their content, different in the information they give, but, but, it's, but it's not impossible for both of them to be true, 
then you don't have a contradiction. You just have a, a, a variation in, in the narrative. And that's what I think we find in the scriptures more often. Now, there could be, uh, frankly, in the present Bible, there can be some passages that one might say were contradictory to other passages, and these could be due to the fact, as the priest said, that there were uh, copies being made, not always in a cave with a single candle, but they were often made in monasteries and other places, which, uh, you know, a, a, let's face it, the Bible came down to us in the 1400 years before the printing press was uh, created uh, or invented. The Bible came down to us through handwritten copies. And the people who hand wrote them were not necessarily supermen or, or inspired men. They were just like us. If we wanted, if you wanted to write out a copy of the Bible by hand, you could do it. I've known people who've done that kind of thing for, for whatever personal edification. And, and there's nothing that would say that you couldn't misspell a word or that you couldn't get the word order wrong or accidentally leave out a word that you didn't know she left out. Uh, I mean, there are things like that that happen in the process of copying. And, and some of the manuscripts, of the New Testament especially that we have, give evidence that that happened a little bit. Not very much. Not very much at all. The scholars who have looked at all the manuscripts and compared them have said that the text of the New Testament is about 97.3% pure, meaning that 97.3% uh, of the material is word-for-word -word verbatim in all the manuscripts. But there's a little tiny bit uh, that it's, you know, where a word order is changed or there's something that isn't verbatim. But these are not it's situations where the uh, where the information is is crucial or, or particularly important information necessarily. Certainly, we can know the the stories of the Bible, the stories of Jesus, the teachings of the apostles, uh, with fair degree of certainty as what they said, without any concern about the differences in manuscripts. They're not that different from each other. They're very minuscule differences. And anyone who really wants to study the Bible, for example can study uh, King James Version and the New American Standard Version. Uh, they use different manuscripts of the New Testament, but you'll find they're virtually the same in all that they teach. There's nothing really different in their teachings. The wording is different in a few verses here and there. Anyway, um, the Catholic Church does teach that the traditions of the Church are as authoritative as the Bible. Uh, they usually say they're both equally authoritative, but really a lot of Catholics come out just like that priest you mentioned did, and say, well, really, the traditions are more authoritative than the Bible. And that's really where Catholics have been at for a long time. I think they, they might say the Bible and the teachings of the Church are equally authoritative, but whenever there's a conflict between what the Bible says and the teachings of the Church, you know, you can't serve two masters. You have to hate the one and love the other. You, you've got to decide, and the Catholic Church always decides in favor of tradition over the Bible. That's like the Mormons. The Mormons say the Book of Mormon and the Bible are equally authoritative, but as soon as there's a contradiction between the two, they always go with the Book of Mormon. So you can't have two ultimate authorities that don't agree with each other and, you know, both equal. You have to have one that trumps the other. To the Protestant, the Bible is the authority that trumps all others. To the Roman Catholic, the church tradition is the authority that trumps all others. Let's talk next to Lily, who's calling from Monterey, California. Lily, welcome to the program. Yes, hello, Steve. Um, I, I'm from Beirut, Lebanon, and my grandfather was studying to be a priest, Catholic. Uh -huh. And uh, I attended many of his debates with the Catholics. And the way he, um, uh, you know, um, explained the saying of Peter, you know, of Jesus to Peter, who am I? And then Peter answers, you are the Christ. Uh -huh. And Jesus said, I will build my church. You're the rock. I'll build my church on you. He He did not want to build his church. He did not probably mean that he will uh, build the church on Peter himself, but rather on the confession of Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Because uh, around that time, uh, when Jesus was explaining to them the fact that he was going to be crucified, and again, Peter, as a leader, always wanting to speak, he said, oh, no, 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 not you. But mm -hmm. what did Jesus say? He said, get you behind me, O Satan. Right. And in the Old Testament, we are uh, told, I believe in Job, that uh, God does not even trust his saints. Mm -hmm. So here we see that Peter uh, did not know what he was talking about. And it seems like the devil had used him. So how is he going to trust him with the keys of heaven? 
And we know that Jesus in Revelation, I believe 1, chapter 1, I'm not sure, he said that I am the one that was dead and I'm alive. And I hold the keys of heaven. He, so, actually, he said, I have the keys of death and Hades. But exactly. later on, uh-huh. later on in Revelation 3, he said, I have the key of David. And I open and no man shuts and I shut and no man opens. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And one more thing I, I want to share with you is the fact that when Paul and Peter um, were arguing about the circumcision, uh, Paul did not give Peter a very good compliment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's interesting that, that Paul said that he, uh, that he had to rebuke Peter publicly right. because it says, because Peter was clearly to be blamed, it says. That's in Galatians chapter 2. Yes. Well, I hope you accept my um, interpretation to this. <laughs> uh, well, sure. You know, uh, now you say your grandfather said that? Yeah. My grandfather and was studying to be a uh, Catholic priest before the Lord got hold on him. I see. I see. So he was familiar with Catholic doctrine, but then he became an very, evangelical very Christian. Well. He wrote yeah. a book. Mm-hmm. I'm writing, uh, reading one of his books right now. And he uh, became a Christian, and I am a third-generation Baptist. Oh, okay. And you come from Beirut, Lebanon. Uh-huh. Must have been a minority over there, huh? Yes. The Baptist. The Baptist? Yes, the Baptist. But they're doing great work. Great, great work. Well, good. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, ex, the explanation that you gave, which you got from your grandfather, is pretty much the one I was raised with. I was raised Baptist right. also. And that, uh-huh. that's the explanation that we were raised with also. And it is a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not the only possible one, but it's a good one. And, uh, my point is, I, I don't necessarily think that Jesus was saying that Peter was the rock, but I don't even care if he was. It doesn't cha- it doesn't make Peter out to be what the Catholics say he was. No. Yeah. And Peter himself said that the foundation of our faith is Jesus Christ. So he didn't yeah. say, I am the rock. So you all listen to me. No, 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 no. So <laughs> That's, right. So. <laughs> That's right. That's well, right. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you, Lily. Good talking to you. Thank you. I, I appreciate your call. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. You've been listening to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. We're essentially out of time for today's broadcast. And so uh, we won't be taking any more calls today. But uh, tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day. And I don't mind going live on Thanksgiving Day. But, you know, I find that on holidays, a lot of times there aren't many calls, especially at 2 in the afternoon when everyone's eating their turkey uh, and visiting with their families and stuff. They're not, you know, they're probably not even listening to the program, but if they are, they're not going to stop and call very often. So we, we're we not going to run a live program tomorrow. We'll run a, uh, a recorded program. I'm not sure exactly which one will be, but it's one that our regular listeners probably have heard before. Uh, but anyway, that's what we'll be doing tomorrow. And then Friday, I'll be back live at the microphone and ready to take your calls again. The Narrow Path is not associated with any particular denomination or organization. Um, I was asked recently who our board of directors was, and, uh, well, we don't have a board because we're not an organization. The, the radio program is just really me and a microphone, and, and we're accountable to everyone who listens to this program to correct, to, uh, to bring rebu- rebuke when that's needed, and uh, we welcome that here. Uh, but because we don't have an organization, we also don't have any financial structure to support and pay the bills for the ministry. The, the ministry bills are essentially paying the radio stations thousands of dollars each month to broadcast the narrow path. That's essentially what our expenses are, plus a, a bill to the phone company for the 800 number. These bills are paid out of money that's spent by listeners. If you'd like to write to us, the address is the narrow path, P.O. Box 3633. Santa Cruz, California, 95063. You can find that and many resources on our website, www.thenarrowpath.com. This is Steve Gregg. Thanks for joining us. God bless you.